Hello everyone, this is Mark Harrell, Senior Pastor of Forest Hills Baptist Church. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm sure there's a lot of topics that you think uh, are very current today that I could be speaking about. Whether it be the pandemic, whether it be the demonstrations, or even the things that are going on with our school systems, trying to figure out in the fall where our children are going to be. Some of you have small children or grandchildren, and no one knows really what's going to happen this school year because of the pandemic. One of the things that's been crossing my mind lately uh, from reading a book called Spiritual Leadership in the Secular Age by Edward Hammett. And the topic there is how are spiritual leaders dealing with the current times? Think about it. Uh, your Sunday school teacher, uh, your deacon, uh, choir director, and even your pastor. The things that we're going through trying to figure out how to lead God's people into a changing age, into times that we've never seen before, um, trying to figure out how to console people. They're losing loved ones. They're dropping them off at the hospital not knowing what's wrong with them, and unable to enter the hospital with them. They may even get the call to come pick up your loved one. He's going to be heading for the funeral home. Never having a chance to say goodbye. How does a church deal with that? Virtual services. Many of you I know are ready to come back to church to return to the sanctuary to worship. But in these days right now with a growing number of uh, COVID positive cases, it's just not safe. And I know a lot of you are wondering, well, we, we go to Walmart, we go to restaurants. Well, you're not sitting still for an hour with someone breathing behind you or in front of you or may choose to wear a mask or not. So there's a lot of issues that are going on today that your spiritual leaders are having to deal with. So I want to bring some of those issues to you today. In Matthew 24 and chapter 12, this is Christ speaking, and he says, And because lawlessness or sin will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Your King James Version may say the love will wax cold. Adam Clark, one of the commentaries that I read, says, By reason of these trials, the trials that Christ had just previously mentioned, and persecutions from without, and those apostasies, people who've fallen away from the faith, and false prophets from within, in other words, shepherds who are misleading the flock, the love of many to Christ and His doctrine and to one another shall grow cold. So openly deserting the faith, as Matthew 24.10, others corrupting it, as Matthew 24.11, and others growing indifferent about it, Matthew 24, verse 12. Now, one of the most difficult duties is that of a spiritual leader. doesn't matter what role you're in. doesn't have to be just the pastor. And... Because of the role that we have, our responsibilities that we have in being a leader in a time of turmoil, it can become very challenging. Our current generation is so diverse, not just generationally because we're living longer and we have multiple generations that are alive today, but also culturally. We have so many diverse cultures that we're dealing with. So when you add in the mix, these days of the changing times and the pandemic, all of these issues and the changing cultures that we're having to look at differently, speak to differently. It's no wonder that many pastors, about 50% of the men and women who graduate seminary in five years will no longer be in the ministry. In just five years. The church in general 
has become unrelatable, not contemporary, because it's refused to change. Now, I know many of you believe, so, well, God doesn't change. The living Word of God doesn't change. So why should we? Let me explain something to you. I believe this also. God does not change. But one of the things that uh, He expects us to do, no matter what the culture is, to figure out how we can change in order to reach this culture. How many of us think about this day and time where you know, our approach in early church and even today has not changed that much? We have a sanctuary. We invite people to come. We preach the gospel, hopefully, and we expect them to respond. Well, if you look at your leaders today, your deacons, ministers, most of those people were born before 1960 or around there. So all the bylaws, the policies, all the things that they come up with for the church are geared toward people of their generation, not this one. That's why it's difficult for people of this generation who probably have never entered a church or been raised up in the church can't relate to the way church is today. So the spiritual leadership has to figure out how do we reach those under 40 without losing those over 60? And the church and its ministries were geared, set up, policies, everything was established for an older generation. So in order to reach this generation, this culture, the church, the body of Christ, not the building, has to be willing to change its approach. You know, the living Word of God is, is full of texts, including terms like pestilence, famine, and drought. All of these can certainly kill a nation. And we're wondering about how high these numbers can go with this pandemic. How many people will pass away because of this virus? But you know, that's not my major concern. This nation has been full of dead men walking because of a spiritual famine, drought, and even a pestilence that's influenced the gospel from many pulpits is being preached today. So we can worry about the pandemic or we can worry about the demonstrations or we can stay on target with what God has assigned us to do and to reach the lost that are out there. What better opportunity does a church have than today? People are in despair they're looking for answers. I had a patient recently tell me that all their services are virtual uh, video services. And an individual told him the other day, he says, you know what, I can't remember worshiping so much now than when I was able to go to church. That he was joining in more through the virtual services than he had ever attended church. That's a good sign. People are looking. People are seeking. You know, we think about 4,000 churches a year in the United States close. And we wonder why. I have to think that's because they weren't willing to change. Willing to look at their community, the demographics. Let me tell you something. If you live in Macclesfield, North Carolina, according to the Census Bureau data, and you're under 45, you're a minority. Most people are over 55. So if you are a church in Macclesfield, North Carolina, you may say, our goal is to reach young people. 
great goal, but you don't have any. You have to reach your community. So whatever people groups live in your community, that's who you're striving to reach. We need to better understand who our neighbor really is and what it's going to take to love our neighbor. Everyone likes to say that the United States is a Christian nation. I have heard this time and time again. You know, that may have been true in the past. However, when you review our actions and those of our Christian proclaimers that we're a Christian nation, I personally don't believe you can call the United States a Christian nation today. When I see the actions of those so-called labeled Christians and see the love waxing cold for this generation, seeing the attitudes that I see, the lack of respect for God's Word, and the peel-on-label, peel-off-label kind of Christian that we see today. Now, I spoke about Christians versus followers of Christ in last Sunday's sermon. Just as Christians like the label to be able to, to stick it on or, or peel it off, and depending on their desires and who they are around, this country has also done the same. Many of our politicians will make decisions not based on what's good for the country, but what's the latest Gallup poll or what's popular versus what is right. As Christians or followers of Christ, we don't have that privilege. The Word of God tells us what's right, not what's popular. In Matthew 24, 12, it's about Christ telling his disciples about the end times. We know this as eschatology. He states that the love would grow or wax cold. We believe he's speaking also about the church in relationship to the trials that they'll have to face. So let me ask you, have you found that from watching the news and all the negative things that are going on, as a follower of Christ, have you felt the love of God in your heart began to wax cold. So you can imagine being a spiritual leader and you're in the same boat as everybody else, losing that luster, that passion that Christ gave us for those that don't know Him. That responsibility, that great commission to reach them, disciple them, baptize them, and teaching them. The CDC has shown that a significant amount of abortions, the abortion rate has dropped. And it's dropped over the last 25 years. According to the CDC, from 1998 to 2016, it's dropped as much as 27.8%. From another study from 1990 to 2017, as much as 46.4%. So we need to understand that we are seeing some impact in this nation. Some good things are happening. And we need to be telling this good news, not only this good news, but hopefully it's because people are praying, people are intervening in, in others' lives and not being full of judgment. So if the spiritual leadership today isn't careful, and doesn't keep up with the changing times, you're going to lead your sheep in the wrong direction. And what you're going to find is that your church is going to suffer a slow death. And what would the community say about that? Now we see how you Christians are. You argue with each other and, and you can't get along and and you, you change pastors all the time like someone changes a suit of clothes. How are you going to reach the community? So we need to understand and be praying for our spiritual leaders in today's secular world. Do you still think that our nation is a Christian nation? 
that is protected by God because we're so obedient to Him, we're so faithful to Him. Christian nation doesn't murder over one-tenth of its population. I know some of this may sound depressing. You may be ready to call your health care provider for some antidepressant medication. But let me tell you something. There's no reason to despair. No reason to despair over the pandemic. What rules are going to come up for our schools? They will do the best they can. And you as parents, grandparents, will have to do the best that you can. Keep the faith. Try to remind everyone to follow those that God has put in authority over us. Let me share what these numbers and signs really mean, especially when you're trying to, to lead a church or uh, you're a deacon with a family ministry. For this we declare to you by the word from the Lord, that we who are alive, we who are left until the, Lord's, until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together, and them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And this next text is important. Listen carefully. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. So if you're going to encourage people today, we have to encourage them understanding that, you know, we're not here permanently. This is not our home. However, the life that God has given us here, the purpose that He's given us here, we have to continue to strive to do that which He's assigned us. Knowing that one day, and maybe soon, Christ will return for the church. What will He find us doing? One of the concerns I have as a pastor is that pastors and teachers face a different judgment. They are more accountable. So the pressure is really on those who lead in the church. However, those in the church who are striving to do that which God has called them to do also depend on the support and backing of the body of Christ. Are you supporting your pastor? Do you support your Sunday school teacher? You know, we always want the deacons to be calling people and seeing how they're doing. Let me ask you something. When's the last time you called your deacon and asked him how his family was doing? Being a spiritual leader in a secular world is growing more and more difficult. Having to satisfy the old ranking guard and in the meanwhile attract a, a culture that is no longer close to that of the traditional church and trying to attract them to come to church and expect them to behave and understand the culture of the church. And, but it's a culture that they can't even relate to. So what's the answer? I believe we have to get motivated. No longer fooling ourselves that in believing that what we're doing is working just fine because we're happy. It's working just fine because we haven't changed anything. We're satisfied. We're content. One of the things about being a spiritual leader is understanding I should never be content where my relationship is with Christ. It can always grow and mature. There's always more that I can do and more that I can learn about serving Him. And it's not being satisfied with status quo because I'm comfortable. So what's the answer? We have to get motivated. David Jeremiah states that the Bible doesn't state that there will be a great revival uh, before the rapture. He says there's no further signs needed for Christ's return. 
And I believe that is true. So if I believe that's true, and you believe it's true, Christ could return any moment. Let me ask you, are you prepared? Seeing all the things that we're seeing today, knowing the signs that have occurred, Israel being a state now, all the things that's happened in the past, if you believe he could return any time, there's your motivation. We have got to reach the lost. We've got to help people understand the love of God and the gift that He's given. Whatever it takes, find some way to get motivated, continue to encourage your spiritual leaders, support them in what God's called them to do, and be ready for change. We already have change already with this virtual services and certainly I would be normally speaking in front of 85 to 90 people in our fellowship hall on a Wednesday evening instead of everyone watching a YouTube video. It is change. But change doesn't mean that it doesn't work. So I want you to invite those that don't know Christ to watch this video, to watch our services on Sunday. Be calling them, praying for them, let them know that you still care for them, even though we have to do the social distancing. We don't have to do it spiritually. Because I'm close to every one of you through God, through my prayers. I thank you for watching. Thank you for your patience with the church right now. We hopefully will return sometime soon. But until then, God is still working. He still loves us. And as followers of Christ, we have no despair. God bless you.